on this week's update, Disney eyes a streaming future. Dexter eyes a return to TV. And Logic eyes a very pricey Pokemon card. All this and more as we reach our next stop, the PCC Multiverse. Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. And we're back with another episode of the PCC Multiverse. This is Gerald Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great shows. And if you can, give us that five star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow us, throw out some of those gaming stars at us, it is truly appreciated. Just want to give everybody a heads up I've got brand new episodes just out. Inside Sports Fantasy Football with Chris Ardieri, where we touch on Dak Prescott's injury and so much more in NFL Week 6. Plus, I just finished an interview with Michael Weisenberg, and that's also available now on the Lakers Fast Break, where we talk about LeBron, the Lakers World Championship, and also the actual episode that we recorded just after the Lakers World Championship, where you can hear me sing, We Are the Champions. I don't know if you really want to, but it's actually very popular right now. So if you want to check that out, it's now available right now on the Lakers Fast Break channel as well. But it wouldn't be a PCC Multiverse without my good friend. He's our own man at Castle FPV on Twitter. You got to reach out to him there or everything that he's doing as far as in his world is concerned. He is my good friend indeed. It is the man talking some expanse later on in the show and Ted Lasso. It Mm. is. Marcus De La Garza and Marcus, great to have you back on once again. Great to be back on. Looking forward to another great episode, and uh, apparently we have some Ted Lasso beef. So I'm looking forward to this one, man. I don't want to say it's a beef because you're a good man, and I really feel like the bad guy in this situation. So we'll talk about that on the back end of the show coming up here about Ted Lasso. But before we do, we're going to talk about a lot of great things, including Joaquin Phoenix becoming Napoleon. Ridley Scott, that's a possibility. Coming to America is coming to Amazon. Adam McKay's got a big movie lined up with a lot of stars. And also, would you pay 200 plus thousand for a Pokemon card? Logic did. And we'll talk about that on the back end of the show. Plus, we have our usual monthly update with our good friend indeed. It is Jessica Boggs from the TV Ratings Guide.com. But my friend, First and foremost, Disney, in what right now would probably be the most obvious of things to go ahead and announce. Earlier this week, they went ahead and talked about with investors that they now have a, I guess, a more direct approach, a reorganization of the entire company and how the focus, shock upon all shockers, actually not is now going to have streaming with Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and ESPN+. Plus. Read the lines through there, my friend, a.k.a. Disney+, Plus, which is now the hottest of the three. Yep. They're going to go ahead and focus more on that, even more with content galore coming there as far as even more priority on what projects they're going to go forward. This time last year, it was like wave after wave, month after month of Disney movies hitting the theaters. In they the not- killing it. And they were killing it. In the not-too-distant future, you will see a reprioritization of that because as the marketplace for the movie theaters is going right now into the tank, they're realizing now the value of going ahead and making streaming a priority for their company going forward. This is huge news. And, I mean, you really set the stage for us there, Gerald. We've done irreparable damage to the entertainment industry with COVID and the way that we're going to consume media moving forward. And so this is the first major company we're seeing 
do some some audibles here and look for a way out. And that's where I'm starting to get excited. We're starting to pump these streaming platforms. And as much as I want us all to be back at the movie theater, at least we have a company that's starting to look forward and see how we can connect with consumers year over year in the next five years, 10 years, whatever it is. This is definitely the push that we want to see as consumers, but we hope that the money stays there with it. You know, as well as I do, Gerald, that piracy is a, a killer. And I know it's it's easy for all, all of us to kind of you know, sit back and laugh about it, but I worry about how the streaming platforms will fare moving forward if piracy becomes an even bigger issue than it already is. I'm concerned about the the volume of movies that's what i'm concerned about because there's only going to be so many dollars to go around yes netflix is still spending up to 200 million dollars <laughs> on movies and we'll talk about yeah. one here coming up in a bit but how many of these projects do they have in the queue disney same thing disney will be spending 100 150 possibly 200 million dollars for some movies that are going to disney plus and in fact right. i'm sure Soul probably costs anywhere from seventy-five to a hundred million dollars, maybe even more, for them, right. and that's going straight to Disney Plus, and that's not even coming with a thirty-dollar kicker like Mulan did. That's just coming straight up in December, which is awesome because I'm really looking forward to that movie. Yeah. I also know that was kind of funny because as soon as they moved out of that slot, The Crudes too moved right into that slot coming up in November. So it was kind of funny how one animated movie goes out. And one animated movie comes in. So it's kind of interesting how that interplay worked there as far as that's concerned. Although I'm not sure if the Croods 2 will have that same kind of magic this time around. But we'll have to wait and see how that works out. But needless to say, there's going to be a reorganization by Disney. They're now doing something that is apparently obvious. It has to be obvious to all these companies and all these movie industry types and all these studios and all these different types of, of venues for these companies it has to be something that's just blatantly obvious that they need to go ahead and make streaming a priority but there again here lies the issue how much money can you make off of streaming and how much can you do it without jacking up the price like an exorbitant amount because we've seen already there's been a great bit of backlash every time netflix tries to hike up the price but people still pay for it that's the deal. So it's a catch-22. Are you going to go Same ahead? Same thing with YouTube TV. Yeah. People keep paying for it despite the price hike. Yeah, exactly. So even though people really have a backlash against it, they ultimately end up paying it because Netflix is closing in on 200 million subscribers. Disney's closing in on 70 to 75 million subscribers, maybe even more. So it's coming to the point where you're going to have to really put streaming at the forefront of everything you're doing as a major company going forward. Here's my only concern, though, pushing the streaming. We saw the $30 price tag on, on Mulan, and mm -hmm. I understand that for a family of five, that's significantly cheaper than going to the movie theater as mm -hmm. well as getting a couple snacks, right? Yeah. But is that too high of a barrier to entry for most families? You know, would most families rather see a $20 or a 1999 title? Well, that's uh, the thing, though. If you're a subscriber to the VIP for Variety, you got the inside numbers of what Nielsen was tracking. And Nielsen was tracking for the month of September – when Mulan came out, that as far as the number of impressions, it was either at the top of Disney Plus or very close to it. In fact, I think it was at the top of what Disney Plus was doing. It reached the top 10, just barely sneaking in at number 9 or 10. Okay. And to give you the kind of impressions, you're paying $30 a pop to see it. So that's like generating a lot more money than whatever number four or number five would be because they're just part of whatever f option that is for the streaming market. Let's say like The Boys. The Boys was also in the top 10. In fact, it was very close to being number one. And it was it's done huge numbers by leaps and bounds. But then again, that's part of the Amazon Prime service. You didn't pay an extra $30 on it. So what I'm yeah. saying is that it's right now could be something that we could be seeing going forward. Maybe some of the Marvel movies, if it continues like this, maybe the Eternals or maybe Shang-Chi, maybe even Black Widow might be approached on that. It depends if you keep on having to delay and delay and delay. At some point with a new reorganization that Disney's doing, they're going to have to focus in on and saying, hey, if we're going to commit to this, we're going to have to put some major, major league stuff on there, not just some great stories that'll intertwine with the MCU. 
actual premium content that would make people say, you know what, I'm going to switch from Netflix to Disney Plus. Yeah, and and just kind of echoing off that, Disney's kind of setting all these IPs and all these divisions underneath one umbrella now, and that's the media and entertainment division. Mm-hmm. MED is going to be responsible for all the marketing, all the decisions on where these titles end up. I'm with you now. I I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see the transition of Black Widow off of the big screen and onto our local televisions. It might not happen until 2021, but with the rate we're going with the delays, it's going to happen December 2021 if we're lucky. (laughs) Well, you never know because it all depends on what Kevin Feige and the, the hierarchy of Disney, what they perceive as far as when do they need to go ahead and continue the MCU timeline and how do they need to span it out? I mean, they can keep on backing up forever, but at some point they're going to have to continue this timeline because you see what's going on with WandaVision. That's going to tell one part of it. That's going to lead into mainly what Doctor Strange is all about. And then you've got coming early next year, supposedly Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You're going to have to tell these stories but they're supposed to be meant to telling the stories intertwined with what's coming up on the movie theaters, or in this case, what these movies that are coming out. So you can only back up Black Widow, The Eternals, Shang-Chi. You can only back them up so far without having to say, you know what, we're going to have to put them out on some type of format in order to go ahead and have this type of cohesion and storyline to keep drawing people in to the MC. You just can't keep on putting it off forever. Yeah. Absolutely. You keep putting it off, people are going to lose interest. It becomes an unwatchable product eventually. Yeah, and that's the that's the thing. I mean, people are saying, okay, you know what? We understand with COVID. We understand why you're delaying it now with all these movies like The Fast and Furious, Jurassic Park, DC. We understand right now why you're passing it off, why you're going ahead and pushing it down the road. We understand and get that. But you could only do it for so long. I mean, you can only have Wonder Woman 84 sitting on the shelf for so long before you have to say, you know what, it better go on HBO Max or else you're going to lose a lot of interest. So again, it all leads down to prioritization over streaming. And the thing is, how much can you profit off of it if you're a movie company? If it's limited, then you're going to have a limitation on what you can produce or how much you can spend on these productions going forward. Disney making some big decisions and they finally did this week. And I'm, I'm very proud of them for doing that. They're going to push the industry forward. What are your thoughts out there on Disney reorganizing everything as far as how they're going to go ahead and approach the future? They're structuring everything more importantly around the streaming outlets, obviously the Disney Plus, Hulu, ESPN Plus, and going forward, looking more towards a streaming future. Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Hey, this is Chad from Ghost Toasters, and you're listening to Pop Culture Cosmos Podcast. You've heard others, but nothing could prepare you for the shameful stupidity that is the Jock and Nerd Podcast. Witness the hubris as they claim to be the world's authority on comic book movies. Who said that? Never said that. We've never said that. Who cares? A jock said that. Comic book, TV, movie reviews, news, and whatever they choose. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Jock and Nerd Podcast. Seriously, people really listen to this. Uh, Jock and Nerd! My friend, I wanted to go ahead and touch on some more movie things coming up. Because it's kind of interesting when you see Ridley Scott. He just did a great series that debuted on HBO Max that was really garnering a lot of critical acclaim, got a lot of viewers interested in what he's doing, Raised by Wolves. I checked out the first couple episodes on on that. I didn't get a chance to go back, but I will because it was such a great series. Raised by Wolves has garnered a lot of acclaim. He's eyeing an epic film, which he's done before, Kingdom of Heaven, that type of deal. I mean, that's one of Josh's favorites. You've mentioned how much you've enjoyed it. I love that movie. Yeah, you both love that movie. I thought it was pretty good. He's going to go ahead with another epic movie. He's going to have it reuniting with another friend of his, Joaquin Phoenix, coming off the Joker. This time, Joaquin Phoenix will be playing Napoleon. So I want to hear your thoughts. I think this performance will break a lot of the stigmas and a lot of the perceptions that many of us have 
in regards to Napoleon, as far as what he did, what he didn't do, even how he looked and how he was portrayed. So I want to hear your thoughts on Joaquin Phoenix in the not too distant future, serving his time as Napoleon in Ridley Scott's next epic film. I don't know why. When I heard this news, I pictured somewhere between King Commodus and the Joker, and that's what Napoleon's going to be. You've got a strategic mind that's second to none when it comes to military strategy. And then you also have somebody that's just a wild card when it comes to Napoleon, when you're talking about the man. I'm with you. He's a man that doesn't get enough credit, and he gets a lot of the jokes because he was a smaller statured man. He wasn't as small as a lot of people think. So that's part of the thing. His description is everything. It's going to break a lot of those stigmas that people have it will. on him right now. Absolutely. And so I'm really looking forward to this movie. So just the, the little bit that I've read on it and the little bit that I've, I've kind of heard, this is going to definitely going to be a war strategy movie with a lot of personal touch in there. So you get a lot more of that feel of Napoleon, why he thought the way he did, why he did the things he did at the time. It feels like there's going to be some stretches made, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see indeed. But I'm excited to see how Joaquin, one of the world's greatest actors right now, Obviously, he has a career that is very much revered and appreciated. And, of course, his turn as the Joker is something that a lot of people didn't think was possible because of Heath Ledger's performance in the Joker, that no one would ever approach that type of performance. And he was able to do so in a performance that was very comparable as far as just the quality of it as what we saw from Heath Ledger. So I'm very interested to see where both him and, of course, Ridley Scott directing him can take an epic with it to include Napoleon. Is it going to be based off of Napoleon himself and just, you know, how he saw things at that period of time? Or is it going to be him just playing a role in it? We're going to wait and see. But it is going to be something very interesting as Joaquin Phoenix takes up the mantle of Napoleon coming up for a Ridley Scott film. What are your thoughts on Joaquin Phoenix as Napoleon? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Pop Culture Cosmos at Yahoo.com. Another movie that's been talked about as far as over the past few months is Coming to America, the sequel to the big hit of the 1980s, which I was surprised it never actually happened or never materialized in the 80s or even in the early 90s. It's now being realized so many years later, but it moved from Paramount to Amazon Studios, which is kind of interesting as far as it's concerned because Paramount is going to be reshaping CBS All Access into Paramount Plus. And if you were sending it straight to streaming, there's no better way to go ahead and start off Paramount Plus than with Coming to America. So I'm assuming this transfer to Amazon Studios means that it's going to go, yeah, it's all about money in the end. Absolutely. Maybe Paramount needs some cash. But I want to yes. ask you this. I mean, does this tell you also as well that Paramount is hurting for cash, but that Amazon right now is in a good position going forward to help boost their Amazon Prime even more. Yeah, this is definitely going to just shoot Amazon Prime up even further. It feels like a play out of the Microsoft book right now where Microsoft went and bought Zenimax Media and Bethesda Studios, all that stuff. This feels like Amazon's going out and, and just trying to acquire intellectual property for the sake of acquiring and amassing intellectual property. And this is a great thing for them. So they just can't commit, like you said, to the amount of dollars that Amazon and Netflix and now Disney is going to be throwing and Warner Brothers with HBO Max is going to be throwing. So in this high stakes poker game, as far as streaming content is concerned, it looks like, like you said, it comes down to money and Amazon's willing to pay to go ahead and put Coming to America on their screens, most likely in the not too distant future. Yeah, I made the same assumption, and and I meant do, no disrespect to CBS All Access. I mean, and I'm, I'm I say that with, with the fact that I subscribed to CBS All Access. Number one, so I could watch Console Wars, which was outstanding. If you haven't watched it yet, and number two, Lower Decks, amazing. I'm with you. It started off a little bit rough, but it finished great. Yeah, it's sad to watch kind of the intellectual property walk out the door for them, especially when Paramount's got some great things. I think in their library that have the potential to really blow up over the next few years. Well, they have the Mission Impossible. They have Star Trek. I mean, I know Star Trek, is on a, as far as a theatrical success or lack thereof, it's not been to level, even though they've had some really good films over the past 25 years that have appeared, like Star Trek 2009, incredible film. Uh, I think the sequel right after it, I thought that was still a very, very good film, in my opinion. 
the third Star Trek didn't do so great for me, and I know it didn't do so great for Paramount, which is reason why that the Star Trek films are now in, in the limbo that they are. But again, it comes down to when Paramount gives up a property like that, which could be a good success and gives that over to Amazon. And I'm assuming, like I said, with this news from Paramount to Amazon, that means that Amazon is going to be airing Coming to America at some point in time, or at least maybe de- debuting in theaters before it goes to Amazon Prime. Am- there's no reason why Amazon wouldn't do that without going to that medium. It's just kind of disappointing to see Paramount give up on a property like that so soon, just before it's ready to come out late this year. I think it was the original release date was going to be December, like Christmas yeah. Day, actually. Mm-hmm. But it, it's not only just coming to America that they've sold. They sold off the Tom Clancy movie that they were getting ready to put out with Michael B. Jordan without remorse. These are big properties, I feel like, that were selling off by Paramount. And, you know, I mentioned it with a little hand motion when you were giving the intro on this piece, but this feels like it's all about money. It feels like a cash grab so that they can start putting money into other titles where they're hopefully hedging their bets and going to make some, some serious cash off of to keep pushing the studio forward. I think so as well. I mean, there's a lot of people that really wanted to see this film, and I, I think they're going to be able now to see it on a platform such as Amazon Prime or maybe even the yeah. movie theaters if it comes out to there. But it just seems like that Paramount Studios does not have the same aspirations or same thoughts on the film as what many other people are hoping for especially because a lot of people thought that the sequel should have come out a long long time ago because the original was so creative was so funny and it was such a brilliant performance by eddie murphy and arsenio hall playing all these different characters you got to remember is they just don't play one character in the film they play several yeah. different characters in the film So it just seems like they're giving up on something that maybe that I would not have if I'm running the company, because I think if promoted properly, this could be something that could be a goodwill hit for fans right now. But no, it's it's across all sorts of storylines there in America. You know, it it didn't matter if you were white, black, Hispanic, Asian, didn't matter who you were. Everybody loved that movie. It was just a universal storyline, it felt like, and it, it felt like something we could all identify with. And so I'm with you. I'm shocked that Paramount gave this up because this feels like a, a guaranteed gold winner. What are your thoughts out there on Paramount giving up on coming to America and sending it over to Amazon? It seems to me kind of a head scratcher. Is it a head scratcher for you as well? Share us your thoughts. Pop culture cosmos at yahoo.com. My friend, before we hit the half hour break and my interview with Jessica Boggs from the TV ratings guide.com giving us our October TV update. I want to talk to you about Adam McKay, who's done such a great job lately. I mean, he's a hot property in Hollywood to work with. You want to go ahead and work with that director. And we see a lot of people that really want to go ahead and work with him. He's got this movie coming up called Don't Look Up. And a ton of people have been announced that are going to be working on that movie. The latest to do so is Leonardo DiCaprio. Also, Jonah Hill. I think also Matthew Perry, Timothy Chalamet, Kate Blanchett, Jennifer Lawrence, Meryl Streep. My gosh, this is an all-star cast. Ariana Grande, Kid Cudi, also wanted to go ahead and be part of it. This is an incredible lineup that it's just really hard to fathom that it's going to be this kind of lineup. But I think this is another Netflix film. This goes back to one of the, we were talking about as far as Netflix, just shelling out the money, but how much longer can they shell out the money? But they've got really with the Chris Evans movie that's coming out, they're spending $200 million there. There's got another few projects in the work that are really costly. Obviously, Stranger Things is going to be costly. And this film is going to be a huge Even if it's not even special effects laden, with the cast members involved, you know it's got to be paying a little bit of a price there. So I want to hear your thoughts on this film. With this kind of all-star lineup, does this get you excited as a movie? Absolutely. This this is definitely one of those movies that's going to be... You also have Hamish Patel, the guy from yesterday, that uh, I think think a lot of people like to leave off as as an acting talent. That guy's outstanding. Yeah. But... This is going to be a hilarious movie. From what we know right now, it's a pair of astronomers trying to warn everyone that Earth is uh, on a giant collision course with meteors. 
this is going to be a, a really fun telling and it's a story that happens over six months. I'm looking forward to this one. I'm, ho- I'm hoping this is like a two, two and a half hour comedy. It's been a while since you've seen something that long in a comedy form, but you know, it's time to laugh, man. It, I'm ready for this one. I'm ready for it too. And with stars, like you mentioned, breakout star, Himesh Patel, Ariana Grande, Matthew Perry, Timothy Chalamet, Jennifer Lawrence, Jonah Hill, Kid Cudi, Kate Blanchett, Meryl Streep, Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, the list is probably going to continue even further. You better make sure that you're going to go ahead and get this A-list talent while you can for your projects. Anytime he hits the open market, you better know he's got another project lined up. Absolutely, indeed. What are your thoughts out there on Don't Look Up? Are you ready for Don't Look Up? Because Don't Look Up Now! There's a ton of great actors heading over to work on Adam McKay's next movie. Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. And also, before we head to the break, I wanted to go ahead and mention to everyone out there that the cult favorite, or you could even say hit show, Dexter, that was such a part of the late 2000s, early 2010s on Showtime, the crazy show that it was with the serial killer as the protagonist and antagonist all in the same measure i mean he was the hero and the villain all at the same time but it was such a interesting show for many people out there i know a lot of people truly enjoyed it and this got a lot of press and also a lot of interest on our pop culture cosmos facebook page but i just wanted to go ahead and mention that showtime is giving the series a limited series run Once again, on Showtime, it's giving it a sort of a basic storyline to go through, maybe eight or ten episode type deal that we're seeing from a lot of streaming outlets already. And that will most likely debut at the earliest, maybe this time next year. We'll have to wait and see, but production is going to be starting sometime early next year on a limited series run for Dexter coming back to Showtime And that show is still beloved by so many people out there. So I know a lot of fans are excited about seeing Dexter once again on Showtime and appearing in a limited series format very soon, hopefully as early as fall 2021. So we want to hear your thoughts out there on Dexter getting a revival on Showtime in a limited series format. Please share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Also as well, you can reach us out on Facebook at Pop Culture Cosmos, or you can go ahead on Twitter at Pop Culture Cosmo, Pop Culture Cosmos on Instagram, or wherever you get your podcasts as well. You can always go ahead and listen to us and leave your comments right where you get your podcasts. Well, coming up right after the break, it's our good friend Jessica Box from the TV Guide.com and Jessica Show. She's gonna stop by with her monthly TV update and in the October TV update she's going to talk about uh, some shows that are getting unrenewed which has been a trend in the past few weeks for some of these broadcast networks and streaming networks and cable networks too so we're going to talk about that coming up here in a sec and then after the break Marcus and I will return talking Ted Lasso also as well The Expanse season 5 they debuted a trailer at the New York Comic Con last week. And last but not least, would you buy a Pokemon card for $220,000? The rapper Logic did. We'll explain more at the back end of the show. This is the PCC Multiverse. Get ready for Kitty Origins Evolutions, the latest documentary from Rob McCallum. Thrusted into heavy metal stardom as teenagers with their debut release, Kitty has thrashed and conquered the heavy metal world for the past 20 years. Kitty has defied industry norms, fought back against women and rock stereotypes, and inspired generations since they appeared. And now, for the first time, they've decided to share their untold story. Generously peppered with archival footage shot by the band, this film gives you an honest and brutal look at what it takes to survive in the music industry. Order the DVD, Blu-ray, and live CD triple pack that features recordings from throughout their 20-year illustrious history from RobMcCallumFilms.com. RobMcCallumFilms.com, your place for awesome stories about awesome people and films worth watching. Back 
of the program. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. I want to thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for listening right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. It's that time once again. She's back for her monthly update right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. You got to check out what she's doing today at the TVRatingsGuide.com. Plus also her great show, Jessica Show, which is available everywhere you get your podcasts. It is my good friend. It is Miss Jessica Boggs. And Jessica, I want to focus today on something a little bit different, but it kind of just struck me the other day because CBS announced that its scripted shows, for the most part, will start trickling out in November. And I know ABC has some shows trickling out already. And I know Fox and NBC have their own plans. There's an interesting trend, and I think really the Hollywood Reporter article that I caught last week really put it out to light. The shows that are being unrenewed, Shows that were actually renewed were actually given the go-ahead, some of which were on the borderline, some of which were just too expensive to Mm -hmm. keep on the slate. So they're getting unrenewed. And these are shows that at the end of their last seasons that they were given the renewal for. Some of them had to wait a little bit longer than others, but they were given the go-ahead. But then coronavirus hit. And because of that, and because of the costs that are now becoming increasingly involved, even though television viewing streaming viewing is in the right direction especially if you're in the streaming industry because the streaming industry obviously is is growing by leaps and bounds we're seeing shows both on broadcast cable and the streaming all yes i want to go ahead and just ask when you see shows like Becoming a God in Central Florida for Showtime when you see Netflix's glow the society, and I am not okay with this. At True TV's I'm Sorry, the USA Network had a evil miniseries that was going to go on. And ABC Stumptown, which, as you know, hurt me greatly. And it was just very devastated to find out that that show will not get a second season unless it gets picked up somewhere else. You're really seeing the effects of what the coronavirus is doing, even for broadcast cable and especially streaming viewing which to me is the biggest surprise i mean i saw this article this morning don't get me wrong but apparently it's in the age of covid it seems like more shows that are behind on production orders are getting their renewals reversed by networks basically the southland treatment of sorts because of the coronavirus the budget has gone up on the scripted end of things when it comes to like PPE use that added around six to seven million on the low end for personal protective equipment, for example. Just and, precautions in general, correct? Yeah. And in addition, there were executive shakeups at Warner Media as well, with the country remaining closed. And so Kevin Riley and Bob Greenblatt are no longer at Warner Media. One of the heads of Netflix also left as well for her own reasons, uh, personal reasons, just decided to go out into a new venture. Of course, you know, with the Netflix cash she probably has and the share she has, she could pretty much do anything that she wants. So, yeah, there's a lot of shakeups. And then Disney, what do you make of this? Is refocusing its entire way of doing things because of what's going on in the moment and shaping up its entire way of doing things in order to structure around the streaming market quite a bit more. Well, yeah, and it seems like with revenues trending downward in general and with movie theaters in key parts of the country remaining closed. And so you have regime changes, cleaning house and making marks of their own. Apparently, the executive shakeup of Warner Media partially contributed to the axing of I'm sorry from True TV. And like I was saying before, this has led to a lot of shows, a very surprising amount of shows being unrenewed after they were given the clearance to go ahead, Stumptown among them. And it just seems like any show that's on the borderline is got to be nervous. They've, but they've got to be nervous as far as their future is concerned because, like you said, several million dollars 
that these studios will have to pay in either, like you said, PPE or staff that's on duty now, either testing or being on there as far as uh, to make sure the precautions are met. You know, there are new people there on the set that have been hired just to go ahead and make sure everything is up to safety standards. So that's a, a larger and larger cost, which, like like I said before, some borderline shows couldn't match up with. Well, yeah, and according to the article, it said Stumptown apparently was planned to be on the network's fall schedule, and they canceled it because episodes, which would have not been ready until at least April, which meant the show, which underwent creative changes and showrunner changes, would have aired in summer, which apparently wasn't a good fit for a show with a sizable price tag already. And with the PPEs and those extra precautions, that increased its price tag. Like you said, with the cost involved, it's not a show that you can put out in summer. It's something that you would have to go ahead and put out in fall to maximize any kind of performance that it could have. Yeah, even though some town was produced in-house. That's a shame. That's a shame for me because I was a big fan of the show. I thought it was really something that had a lot of promise. But we seemingly do that every year when it comes to one of my shows. It always seems to get the axe. seems like every year we're talking about another Gerald show that he likes. So I think I might be refrained from saying I like a show in the future because that might be the kiss of death right there for you. I will try to refrain from my love for any of these shows that are on the cut line or right there on the border because, you know what, with Deadly Class, Stumptown, Timeless, <laughs> the list That me. lasted three seasons. Yeah, well, still, I can't like a show, it looks like. So I will go ahead and refrain from that. But again, the serious nature of these shows getting unrenewed, it's something that we might even see extended even more going forward because of the fact that these costs, the skyrocketing costs of these making these shows is in some cases outweighing the performance that it actually has. Yeah, USA Network, especially with Evil, the miniseries, it became the first to scrap a show because of the pandemic in July when the window in which one of the actors from This Is Us would have filmed Evil closed. Milo Ventimiglia. Yeah. Absolutely. Scheduling yeah, issues. Yeah. And then scheduling issues were also largely to blame for the cancellations of the society and on becoming a god in South Florida. Which is uh, very sad to see. But again, uh, you know, it's just something that we're going to have to realize and deal with going forward that the networks out there are going to prioritize the shows that work very well with them, that do obviously get a return as far as substantial viewership. Those that are not seeing as much or maybe like those cult hits that you and I have pointed out in the past or shows that have a nice following but don't have a large following, those shows are going to be nervous now because that could happen to them. Yeah, recently we did have an article on the TV ratings guide called like a lousy ending glow. (laughs) Yes, that was a show that was critically hailed, something that had its nice fan base. But obviously, for scheduling and cost reasons, it seemed like it was too much for Netflix to handle. Yeah, Glow was in the process of filming episode two of its fourth and final season when production was shut down. Mitigating health risks understood, this left season three's bittersweet finale as the underwhelming end. Again, another critically hailed show that had a nice following, uh, unfortunately met its end. If it had garnered the ratings, let's say, of the Umbrella Academy, which Nielsen reported, and also I'm sure you guys took a hit on as well, that it was the number one show on Netflix for August. And then let's say it had those kind of ratings. I think you would have seen that show still stay on the air and continue production. I think it was a matter of this, how much do you want to support a show like that? Well, yeah. And it's like mostly to do with cost and a lot of things going on behind the scenes. In addition. Yeah. Well, again, I have Jessica Boggs from the TV guide.com. You got to check out what she's doing today at the TV guide.com. And of course her show, Jessica show available wherever you get your podcasts. So I turned the floor over to you before we head on out. What's going on? Any other TV updates? I mentioned that CBS is slowly in the month of November going to start creeping out some of its scripted programming. 
And there's always other news going on in the world of television. So I'll turn it over to you before we head on out. So, yeah, like recent ratings um, apparently were hit and miss on all the broadcast networks. I know the ratings for the NBA were down. I also know that ratings for baseball are down. I think football is down as well, if I'm not mistaken. And down a little bit, but not 100%. Apparently, the mass Singer is down about 17% from the last season. So it but seems it's like- still like the top-rated show on on Fox at the moment. But yet the very the low the lowest rated shows were LA's Finest, Filthy Rich, and Next. Well, it looks like the LA's Finest and also the low ratings, unfortunately, for season one's debut of Star Trek Discovery on CBS. I know those got minuscule ratings as well. It's just a shame that these shows on streaming networks that were brought over specifically as time filler couldn't find a new audience it's a shame especially in star trek discovery's case i was very disappointed to hear about the the lack of ratings for that but before we head on out i want to ask you this when it comes to what we'll be seeing in the future i think that the lower ratings from a broadcast standpoint even though more people are at home and available to watch tv i think the power of streaming is coming more and more into play I agree. And you get the binge format and stuff versus like watching it live. Well, you don't get to binge as much unless you're watching previous seasons because the fact that most are limited on production. So like, for instance, the boys, people got angry because it wasn't brought out all at once. Like the previous season that was brought out week to week. And so now you're seeing these streaming networks deviating away from the, what they were doing before because they got people sucked in based off of, okay, we're going to just pop, pop a season right there on you. Now, because of what's going on with COVID and limited production and, and obviously limited content that they're being able to show, they're going ahead and, and doing it the old fashioned way, putting it out on a week by week basis. Yes. And not sure how that's going to work out, though. Out of all the broadcast networks, like NBC's new comedy, Connecting, I just got to say this. When an episode of the final season of Supernatural beats a debut episode of a comedy, you know something is up. Something is up indeed. Again, you know it's th- bad. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. That's bad. And you know what? You and I have talked about the CW at length, about the... Well, the lack of success they had. And that's something next month we can talk about. I want to talk to you about some of these networks that are out there that are consistently garnering low ratings. I want you to go ahead and put on your studio executives hat coming up for next month. And I want you to go ahead and see if there were any networks around there, whether it's broadcast, streaming, cable. I'm going to let you choose five. I'm going to let you choose five networks to go ahead and get the X. All right. Since, you know, you at the TV ratings guide.com, you and the crew always deal with shows that are being canceled. Let's go ahead and see if we can cancel five networks and we're going to give our reasons why. So how about doing that? Okay. Put on your studio executives hat for next month in November, and we'll go ahead and just give our thoughts on five networks, which are really not, doing too much in the way of business right now and maybe be better off doing something else. How's that sound? Oh yeah, that sounds good. While we're live streaming. Yes, yes. So Miss Studio Executive and myself right here, we're going to go ahead and see what we can do to pick out five networks on next month's TV update. But before we head on out, I want you to go ahead, my friend, and give us an update on what you're doing at the TVRaiseGuide.com Jessica's show or whatever else you want to promote because the floor is now yours, my friend. What's going on in your world? Well, the TV ratings guide is starting our fall slate of originals, including the fourth season of Network. And we're also gearing up on Renew Cancel updates. We did have the latest Fox Renew Cancel update at the moment. And we do have some shows that are likely getting the axe. Hmm, very interesting. But again, Jessica Boggs doing an outstanding job every single month. She's on the show. 
She's going to put her studio executive hat on for November. So will I. So we'll see which networks we're going to go ahead and cut next month in November, along with her TV update. It'll be a little bit more active because more shows will be out. She'll get a better gauge on which shows are going to be successful and which ones are going to be unrenewed coming up on our November TV update right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. I want to give a big shout out to our friends at Retro City Games where it's 10% off store-wide throughout the entire month of October. Either in Henderson or Las Vegas, they've got two great stores. Please head on down there to support local businesses today right here at Retro City Games. And we're back to close out the show. This is PCC Multiverse. I want to thank so much Jessica Boggs for those listening on audio formats all over, including radio and every podcast outlet. I want to thank her so much for being a part of the show once again with her monthly TV update where we talked a lot about all the unrenewals that are going on in television right now, which is kind of a shame indeed. But if you have any thoughts for her, you can always share it with us, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com or reach out to all the great staff and crew at the TV ratingsguide.com. But before we head on out, my friend, I got some questions for you. We're going to go ahead and start off with The Expanse, which had a sneak preview trailer, which I alerted you of, which dropped at New York Comic Con last week, which got you very excited and very hopeful for their December Season 5 release. On Amazon Prime, again, we yeah. talk about them. Amazon Prime is killing it right now. After Jeff Bezos saved The Expanse a couple of years ago, this is going to be the front runner for their sci-fi series. How do you walk away from this this franchise right now? It's hot. People loved season four. Season five has a debut of de- December the 16th. And we're going to see some new storylines here. We've got some new characters coming in. Naomi's got some returning characters from her previous life. I mean, this is going to be the same cast coming back with some new faces and a storyline that's going to really test the limits here. You get to see the Rosinante fractured hole. It's a good story, The Expanse, that they got a fresh start on Amazon. They got someone that, or in this case, a network to believe in them when they were dumped by sci-fi. It just seems to be one of those cases where this could be something that, in hindsight, is twenty twenty. This could be something that could have been like a cornerstone for NBC, Universal, and Peacock. Because when they cut them out, they were in the infancy of coming up with something like Peacock. Or maybe they hadn't as of yet. But they gave them the cut. Amazon picked them up. Universal and NBC didn't think enough of this show to keep them on for season four. And what do they do? They go ahead and they, like you said, they kill it on Amazon They get approved for season five. People are very excited for season five, The Expanse. And to me, it looks like a calculated mistake by NBC and Universal. Seeing how Peacock, even with all of its options, both free and paid, could have really used something like this. Yeah, it was mind-blowing when sci-fi let this walk. And, you know, I knew at the time it was all, mo- again, all money-based. The CGI for this stuff is it's expensive. And when you're not seeing the return on investment because you're on Sci-Fi Network and not NBC, it's hard to justify spending that money, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't know if The Expanse was right for NBC out the gate, but after they had one successful season, have we ever had a TV show transition off of a, a lower network like Sci-Fi over to NBC, like proper NBC? Well, no, but I, I they could it would have been on Peacock, the streaming service. Well, yeah, yeah, and, 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 like, and I got that. And, and, and but I mean, like, I'm trying to think of like anything that would have allowed them to maintain the property, right? Like, could they have maintained the property before? I mean, because we're seeing that with Star and... Trek Discovery now, where it got season one got put on CBS because CBS doesn't have anything as far as scripted dramas or anything right now yeah. to showcase. They're just starting to go ahead and do that now and in November. Going forward, they just announced that they're going to have all the scripted dramas come back slowly but surely, but they had to go ahead and have filler that they needed, and so they put Star Trek Discovery Season 1 there. It hasn't gone over well, which is a shame for that show because it's so quality and so well made, but what I'm saying is not put it on NBC in the case of The Expanse, but I mean, if you knew you had something planned as far as for the Peacock Network, if you already had some designs on that, and you're looking for content. I mean, we saw Brave New World, that movie come out for them with Alden Ehrenreich, 
And that was a special effects, somewhat laden, a lot of green screen there. And that really wasn't that good or well thought of. And that's not something you want to debut your network with. You could have put a show like The Expanse on there. If you're willing to invest money, I would have put my money on The Expanse and having that go as an exclusive to Peacock, if that's the case. Because you see, obviously, the effects of putting it on Amazon Prime. This was something that was one of those shows that was on the fence. It could have gone either way as far as being sent off into oblivion or having a strong enough audience that it could build off of it. And you saw it's done the latter. So I'm very yeah. happy for them. I'm very happy for you and the fans out there of the series that it's gone, you know, above and what, what I think even Amazon ex- uh, expected. I don't think Amazon was expecting the kind of interest that season four got when it first came out last year. And we were talking about it last year. Yeah. And, and Gerald, I got, I got to point out, man, the, the, the big thing for me was that when we talked about this last year, my sticking point was think about all the things that Amazon can do for the expanse as a franchise. Mm-hmm. I mean, Amazon Studios alone was the best thing that ever happened to this franchise. I would say, you know, sci-fi did a good job, uh, but I feel like season four got taken to a new place. The storyline, the the writing was just, a, I felt like was a lot better. The visuals were outstanding. They did a wonderful job with the CGI. This was just a better package than sci-fi was putting out. I'm happy the, the transition happened. You know, I'm trying to sit here and theorize how we could have kept it at NBC Universal. I'm with you. They should have kept it for Peacock. They should have kept it for anything. But I'm going to go ahead and assume that there were some disconnected discussions happening in the boardroom where, you know, one division was thinking about let's set up a streaming service and the other division was trying to think about how do we sell these IPs off to get some money to build some. Or cut costs in- entirely. Yeah. Last thing I want to say, and, and I know I'm, I'm dragging on about the expanse here, but this is going to be a weekly release schedule. It's going to be December 16th, December 23rd. It's every seven days thereafter. I'm really excited about this. So for everybody out there, it's going to be coming in mid-December, every Wednesday for you. It is the expanse season five. I know Marcus is looking forward to it. Hopefully he'll be able to give us updates each and every time out on the PCC multiverse because he'll be just I'm freshly. Yeah, yeah. He'll get those fresh views of it each and every time out. So what are your thoughts out there on The Expanse coming back for Season 5 to Amazon Prime? Did you think it was a big mistake for NBC and Universal to let it go off of sci-fi? Share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com Well, two last things we need to talk about. One is Ted Lasso, my friend. And Ted Lasso, you wanted me to go ahead and check out an Apple Plus. And I did check out a couple episodes. And yeah, and you know what? I told you how much I appreciate you coming on the show. So I want to go ahead and keep my words nice and keep my words decent because of the fact that, you know, I want you to stay on the show each and every week. So it's, it's like, sometimes I think about Ted Lasso as a show and it's just like, wow, I just want the entire world to watch this because he is such a wholesome character. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. And it's a, it's a, it's a story about rebirth, right? So you look at uh, you look at what he did, and the story revolves around him being an American football coach for a division team football team, going uh, overseas, going to the UK, getting a, a premier yeah. job in a premier league, and yeah. obviously the pitfalls and craziness from someone who really has no clue what he's doing. And you mentioned it on last week's show that this comes from a sketch that was done on SNL some time back, and that's the thing. This is another example of an SNL skit trying to be extended out either to a movie or in this case, a series. And for me, the joke works thin. I'm going to be honest with you, man. And it just, Jason Sudeikis, he tries and give him more props. But, you know, the British humor, I, I really get into British humor, especially with certain movies and certain television shows. I've really gotten into it. Yes, we get the idea. Yes, you guys think he's an idiot. It's over and over and over. And it beats the dead horse. And they try to do the same jokes as far as him. Like you said, Everybody calling him an idiot, him letting it go over his head, and him doing something to reinforce the fact that he's an idiot. With sitcoms and comedies as a whole, it's really hard to make me really think that this is good comedy. I don't know why. I just, I honestly don't. And and see, you know, it is a comedy at, at, out the gate, but it's more of a dramedy for me. I, I don't know. It, it really is. To me, it's a story of rebirth. You look at a man who uh, might have had success on one side of the pond and he comes to the other side and it's about him trying to find his way. It gets really goofy. Yeah. So it's hard to put that drama in there, my friend, and take it seriously at all because I know. it is I know. so goofy. It's hard to take it seriously with so much going on that's buffoonery. If you're a fan of sports culture, if you love the background behind the scenes, you know, stuff that goes on in the locker room and a little bit of 
crass British humor, this is the show for you. It's just that this is just, again, one of those cases where an SNL skit gets extended much longer than I can appreciate. And I'm glad you, and I'm so happy you can appreciate it much more than I can. This makes me feel a little bit bad about my taste in Ted Lasso now. Oh, no, man. Don't it. See, that's why I was afraid to go ahead and, you know, you asked me to watch it. But this is why we have these discussions and we talk, watch these shows, right? What our tastes are. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate that Ted Lasso doesn't scratch that itch for you. But I will say, I think there's a whole subsect of the pop culture cosmos that, that will love this. And that, yeah, but absolutely. There's, but there's the other half out there that probably going to hate it. Take it with a grain of salt. I would definitely go watch at least two episodes, three episodes. It really spoke to me for some reason. Well, absolutely. That's what I want everybody to do. If you can go out there and give Ted Lasso on Apple Plus two, three episodes on there and tell us your thoughts on it. Do you agree with Marcus? And I hope you do. I hope you agree with Marcus more than you agree with me because I really want you to enjoy it out there. So if you agree with Marcus, hopefully you will. And even if you don't and you agree with me, share us your thoughts on Ted Lasso. I hope you agree more with Marcus than I do. But again, share us your thoughts. Pop Culture Cosmos at Yahoo.com. Well, my friend, it's been a great episode, but before we head on out, would you pay over $220,000 for a Pokemon card? Logic did. Would you? Absolutely not. That's illogical. (laughs) No, I I, look, I understand why he did this. This is the most perfect Charizard card you can get. It's a rated a PSA 10. Yes. Uh, if you look on IGN, they've got a, an article on this. It's a PSA 10. This is definitely a mint condition card that nobody else in the world might own. And if they do, there, there's probably only a handful in the world that are probably still this kind of mint condition. Yeah. So this is insane. I can't believe he paid $220,000 for it. But it's a, there was a buyer's premium added in. So it was 183 was the original selling price. And then by the time they got to the premium, it was 220 So this is um, uncalled for. Well, it's not even the most expensive Pokemon card. That's the deal. There was, I guess, a if you look at that article even more, there was a card that actually is more expensive than that that was purchased by someone else a while back that was, I guess, a prototype card of some type. So that's a rarity even more. That was something that I don't think it was. It was a prototype card. I don't think that was produced to retail or ever put out on okay. retail. It was a prototype card that was purchased for more than that amount. So that tells you the kind of money there. But then again, you're going to see this kind of action, and we're already seeing it this year from baseball cards, sports cards, basketball cards, other cards of any type. We've seen it from pop culture cards as far as going up in value. And most importantly for people out there, if they collect them, Magic the Gathering cards as well. Magic the Gathering yeah, cards yeah. are going up and skyrocketing value and Pokemon cards. So if you have valuable cards out there, my gosh, you better go ahead and start doing what you can to keep them nice. Get that dust off them. Make sure you go ahead and get them sealed and get them rated because a Pokemon card that's really valuable could mean a lot of money in your future. I do want to say just really quickly, hold on to those Pokemon cards. They're going the way of the vinyl record. It's going to be very, very valuable in about 10 or 15 years. Come on, Marcus, $220,000. They're valuable now. They are, but think about a, a original pressing Led Zeppelin IV or something. Like the, the value on that got to be insane. Uh, I haven't seen a, an auction on one of those in a while, but they used to be outrageous even at that time. Well, it could be like a Wu-Tang Clan vinyl that was only made one of. And that was, yeah, well, you know the story behind that one. But would you out there pay over $220,000 for a mint Pokemon card? We want to hear your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. My friend, my collecting days have ended in regards to Pokemon cards, but it was truly a great time speaking to you, my friend. As always, I cannot thank you enough. Any last thoughts for you on the way out? Not at all. Just uh, I hope you enjoyed Ted Lasso. If you don't, please drop us a line. I would love to talk to anybody about it. Hit me up on Twitter. It's Castle FPV. That's K-A-S-T-L-E-F-P-V. Just started a new job this week. I'm looking forward to it. I'm TAing some coding students. So if you have some time, hit me up on Twitter. I don't have a lot of time to talk to in the day, but I have all the time in the evenings that I can respond to. So to my students out there, I'll see you tomorrow. There you go. A working man indeed. So go ahead and hit him up. Ted Lasso, yay or nay? Let us know. Pop Culture Cosmos at Yahoo.com. So for Marcus de la Garza, this is Gerald Glassford. 
It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the PCC Multiverse. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great